Okay, we have uh, Mamuka Tsereteli today to, man to, uh, to moderate the panel. Welcome to everyone. Thank you. Uh, welcome back to room. Uh, we have pretty difficult uh, now challenge to face after first part of this discussion. A lot of issues were covered, uh, um, uh, and um, not much ground for optimism looking at future. But uh, we are all here to still uh, look at uh, both um, past and uh, but also present and future of this um, evolving uh, process of uh, ensuring energy and particular natural gas security for Europe. Uh, thinking about, there are several people in the room, of course, uh, who remember uh, discussions about this subject, this subject from late 90s in this town, and um, being part of those discussions, uh, um, I remember what, how much optimism we had at that time that Europe could be really energy independent, uh, in a sense that uh, it will have uh, multiple supplies of natural gas coming to Europe, and one of those sources obviously being Russia, but there were supposed to be other sources could, who could balance supply of uh, energy, natural gas to, to Europe and to ensure that, uh, uh, that uh, no one, no country or no uh, group of countries is uh, manipulated or dependent on a single supplier that has political agenda. Unfortunately, today's reality uh, show and discussion this morning, this, uh, this afternoon show that uh, we are far from what we hoped for at that particular time of um, our uh, discussions and our um, activities. But good news is that several big projects were materialized from, if you look at again to past, that includes uh, natural gas pipelines that come from Caspian Sea all the way to Turkey and now to uh, headed to Europe. And uh, while you know, I uh, obviously uh, there are forces that we are not supportive enough to ensure that uh, that uh, larger volumes of natural gas are coming from alternative sources to Europe and policymakers are obviously the ones to be blamed. But uh, uh, still, uh, elements of infrastructure is in place. Some of them are advancing and developing. And uh, the success stories of Baku, Tbilisi, Jehan mentioned earlier, uh, as well as other pipelines uh, from, uh, from Caspian region, show that if there is a political will and engagement, uh, economics could be worked out. And that's um, sort of my short intro to this discussion. We have excellent panel to follow up to our previous excellent panel. Our first speaker will be Ambassador Rika Shemer Kenny, uh, am I pronouncing correct? Uh, former ambassador from Hungary and uh, uh, currently with the Center for European Policy Analysis, which is a, uh, obviously an avant garde of uh, discussions about uh, security and uh, both economic and policy uh, and political security of, of Central Eastern Europe. Our second speaker will be uh, Mr. Ralph Mamadov, who is a uh, at, at Middle East uh, Institute, resident scholar there. And uh, um, our next speaker will be uh, Mr. Ilya Zaslavsky, uh, who uh, uh, is with uh, Free Russia Foundation. And uh, they all have very interesting subjects to discuss. And I'll let, uh, without further delay, Ambassador to start. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I'm very pleased and honored to be here. I was very much looking forward to the discussion, and indeed the first panel was way above even my high expectations. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I think the, uh, the possibility to discuss is real, these uh, questions is really uh, very important because we're in a very uh, sensitive moment in European uh, um, energy security and in European security uh, for the next decades uh, shall be most probably influenced by decisions made these years, these 
months uh, and or the lack of decisions that are going to be uh, left out. So I very much believe that these discussions are hugely important because what we can see is from the previous discussions as well, North, the uh, Nord Stream 2 pipeline presents the single greatest threat to European solidarity, security and stability for the, years to, uh, for the decades to come. Uh, this pipeline is a direct breach of European law and the existing regulatory protections for consumers of the principle of market competition and fair play. But it does not just do harm to legal documents and market principles. It is the most uh, serious direct political uh, project and a political uh, and strategic uh, consequences that will be coming out of this uh, reality. Um, Nord Stream 2 aims fundamentally to redefine and define uh, the uh, framework for Central East Europe and the European Union's energy supply structure. And the genius of the idea is that Europeans pay for half of the cost. Uh, despite the seemingly obvious strategic challenges, uh, we now have to realize that we're on the verge of a, of a shift or we are in the midst of this shift uh, when we have to shift our focus from the questions of what if Nord Stream 2 is completed to what happens when Nord Stream 2 is completed, which is a completely different set of tasks and challenges that we uh, set to ourselves. Because what we are obviously aware of is that the construction of Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 will become the major supply route uh, for natural gas from Russia, which could very easily and largely replace all other gas corridors running through Eastern European and Central East European countries. It will fundamentally distort the European energy market. The question is what will happen, what this exactly means. Um, this distortion will take place in a very short period of time. So the adjustment to this is relatively, it requires also flexibility, uh, rapidity of decision making, and um, uh, the necessary instruments have to be accorded to these uh, decisions to be effective. Obviously, there is plenty of other gas sources and routes to bring gas to, uh, natural gas to, to Europe. So it's... Um, uh, a lot of uh, the other options uh, that are on the table will need to be uh, discussed. But what are the consequences that we can expect um, from a Central East European point of view? The revenues that will be cut for Ukraine and the other Central East European countries, uh, together with the financial, as an effect, ha will have the financial undermining of the economy, uh, which will be, be a fundamentally uh, destabilizing factor for the entire Ukrainian uh, uh, development. But it will also cement the presence of Russia into Central East Europe in a, in a way that we have not seen since 1990. And I think what we can sort of conclude to as a sort of a result of the, the expectable consequences is that we will see a recreation of the type of or that Nord Stream 2 will recreate the type of very direct and strong relationship between the sole supplier uh, of natural gas to its uh, Central East European markets that we have not seen since 1990. It will recreate the type of division on the continent between uh, the market-oriented Western countries and the Central East European countries that we thought we, were, we left behind us in 1990 again. And it will create new things as well, besides recreating uh, an old framework. It will create a new development as well, a special relationship that will develop between, that is developing between Germany and Russia, which will be defining the whole European context in a very different way. So it will create another um, very visible thing, a very visible uh, separation between Germany and Russia and, U and the US and a very visible sort of diverging uh, set of priorities in terms of strategic thinking and strategic concerns, not just in energy policy, but in other uh, international security issues. So what we can see is that Nord Stream 2 is really a kind of a project that will fundamentally be the tool for the reversal of the gains of 1990 in uh, the European continent, uh, and with an extension 
of that logic for the rest of the extension of the logic that was valid for the Central East European part of the continent to the Western part, to some of the Western part of the continent as well, and definitely through a very special Russian-German Russian relationship to the European Union decision-making at the same time. What we have seen as a result in Central Europe, which is what I briefly wanted uh, enlist to you, is um, a set of uh, technical answers of how to handle that, legal answers that we have been trying with the European uh, gas directives, and those have been really important, and of course it is not to underestimate them. But we have, we have been seeing some very important infrastructure developments in Central East Europe to respond to this challenge. If you recall back in the early or mid-1990s when we first started to talk a little bit about energy security, it seemed like it was a chicken and a rag problem because the countries of Central East Europe, when they were talking about a potential cooperation from Poland to Hungary and then uh, to the Balkans to Croatia, was that why should they invest in developing infrastructure into interconnectors to linking their countries' markets if all they have is Russian molecules in the system? So all they can do is just to trade <coughs> Russian molecules to Russian molecules. So investment was discouraged. Uh, in terms of the smaller interconnectors that, was, that were needed to create a larger platform for trading uh, uh, in the region. But in lack of a, a larger platform, all the markets remained very segmented and small in and of themselves, so there was no point in investing a larger infrastructure to bring in non-Russian molecules into the system, like an LNG terminal. So it was a chicken and egg. Do you, what do you start with? Do you start with building the worthless interconnectors, or do you start with getting an LNG terminal to the system? And the Central East European countries' decision was to solve what was possible for them, which, is to, which was to create the interconnectors. As a result of this, we now have, and that's the success story, if there is uh, in this regard any, we have now the uh, Hungarian-Romanian interconnector, we have a Hungarian-Slovak interconnector, the Polish-Slovak interconnector is being built, and that I think is going to be a very important element of this uh, system. We have a Hungarian-Serbian and a hungarian uh, uh, Croatian interconnector. I think it shows a little bit the, the, the it's because of the geography of the, syst uh, the system that it's um, um, that gave this um, uh, that made this possible but definitely what we see now is that we have a large enough platform at the same time the Polish decision to develop and build an energy terminal in Trinoisha was fundamentally strategic and that was allowed and facilitated by the previous development of these interconnectors. So I think we managed to break, we in Central Europe, managed to break through this sort of chicken or an egg problem and get the platform that then made it possible and uh, economically reasonable also to have access to the world markets through uh, a potential uh, uh, LNG terminal. What is logical of all these infrastructure developments is what happened. It seems all very clear. Obviously, we all need it. The question is, why do we still have some missing elements? And that was touched a little bit in the previous panel. I think one of the most important and most painful missing element is the southern access to the world markets, which we still don't have, which is the Croatian uh, LNG terminal at Kirk. And I have been very very much involved in this, supporting this in, in uh, for from the beginning. Uh, I have seen this developing. I think it's a very sad story of how uh, the same malign influence can stop a major infrastructure from happening, which would be in the interest of all of these countries. Uh, in a Twitter style, I, would, I thought of giving you an update of what is happening at this very moment in developing the necessary further elements of the infrastructure to be able to withhold or handle the um, uh, promote the, uh, the interest of developing a market in, uh, in the region. One of the most important uh, developments is the, um, what is called the Brua uh, pipeline, which I, I think is fundamentally uh, important from um, Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, and Austria. It should link these countries together. And the, it, the construction of this pipeline goes as much as uh, planned. Um, what is very important at this stage is to see that the very uh, un in unstable and rapidly changing Romanian uh, legislative environment makes it a, a project that is 
easily under the of, under uh, malign external pressure, uh, and Grasprom has been able to advance its South Stream Light sort of project uh, because of this uh, slowness in the uh, um, Romanian decision making system. What is another? Um, important project that we have to see is probably um, unfolding more or less is the um, or at least being discussed is the Hungarian Austrian uh, pipeline connection, which I think is a very interesting example of the opposite of what of a project that is rather redundant and it is more serving the interest of diverting attention away from from important developments than helping the uh, uh, development of the market infrastructure in Central East Europe that is needed uh, for the energy supply security. Um, and then, obviously, uh, what might be interesting is another um, question, uh, project that is being discussed and that is hope, I mean, it shows a very interesting direction also, is the Hungarian, Slovenian, Italian uh, interconnectivity or pipeline. Uh, which, um, according to the first um, um, assessments, it, it seems that there is a, the aggregated demand seems to be very interesting, and I think it's something that will have to be considered and promoted. But uh, bes be besides these projects, in which we can see that the region itself is doing a lot to, to advance, and I think it is uh, relatively... Uh, clearly identifying the priorities, what I think is very important for us to see beyond this and understand why uh, we, how did we get here? How is it possible that 30 years after 1990, when we have been able to sort of promote the most important strategic depend, uh, uh, dependency uh, or uh, de uh, independence that is needed for the region to maintain the gains of 1990, uh, I think it is very important to note that the reason, the, the reason behind the, the problem that we have seen with Germany and the uh, sort of parallel dialogue, the lack of understanding, the misunderstanding on Germany's side of the importance of Nord Stream 2, and the misunderstanding of, or the lack of understanding on the, uh, on the rest of the world side, as we have uh, heard from Vladimir, of not understanding Germany, is a very clear result of, or consequence, of a lack of, in, of real strategic dialogue. And something that we have neglected for two decades, definitely, in the transatlantic framework, in the transatlantic structures, and something that was a major strategic mistake. It is something that we have to go back to, and we have to start discussing with each other, because what is a lag or what is a difference of, of understanding of the strategic consequences and the uh, rationale of uh, regional infrastructure building or the, of not building Nord Stream 2 um, is the, um, uh, the result is here in front of us, this major division between um, sort of the, the core of the uh, uh, Euro-Atlantic cooperation. So I think that one of the most important uh, next step that we have to focus on is not just the technical uh, questions of uh, um, focusing on the EU legislation or uh, seeing whether Denmark is going to be able to uphold its uh, position vis-a-vis uh, -vis Nord Stream 2, not just the infrastructure developments, which are equally important, but uh, in addition to this, to refocus on the strategic dialogue between the US and the European uh, decision makers, because without that, it's not going to be. There will be another project, even if we were, they weren't, it seems like Nord Stream 2 will not be stoppable. But even if it were stoppable, there would be another issue coming up because we are on a, in, in a different strategic priority environment. So we have to focus on that as very much as a part of our future discussions. Thank you. Thank you. It uh, looks like uh, you are right. Uh, probably Nord Stream 2, even with the sanctions, US sanctions, is probably unstoppable at this point. I'm very pessimistic that 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 will prevent that project from development. But uh, the one other detail, I, I want to just to compliment your, your uh, earlier points that, you know, in 90s, there was a grand strategy that the US had about ex 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 enlargement of uh, Europe in general, that including NATO, European Union, and so forth. There was a grand, grand idea that was complemented with different, different policies. We are missing that larger sort of vision for uh, 
Europe and pretty much for the world in the last probably a decade or so. And that's a, that's a reality that we are facing. Uh, and probably some of our uh, discussion will, will demonstrate that, uh, that this picture is even, even gloomier than, than, uh, than, uh, than we discussed so far. Although, as I said from the beginning, there are some positive elements there as well. So Ralph, maybe you can tell us a few, few words about yeah. those. Whether I can uh, be very sanguine about uh, about uh, the developments, but I'll try to. When I was thinking about this uh, presentation, I, I knew that there there will be so much said about these projects. So much have been said, starting from '90s, although I was a kid in '90s. But I do remember um, when the Nabucco discussions uh, started in two, early 2000s, and when I started becoming part of it in mid 2000s, when I started working for SoCard, and I had chance uh, to be involved in these processes myself. So. Um, I will try to tackle these questions that I'll, I'll mention. Uh, and based on my experience and knowledge, again, I'll try to answer these questions, whether um, Gazprom pipelines, whether Gazprom perceives non-Russian east-west gas pipelines as, a, uh, as an opposition, as a, as a competition, how does, is it perceived in, in South Caucasus, in Azerbaijan, among the consortium members, and what the reality is. Um, What's going on now? To what extent the, the physical construction uh, has been completed in mainly in the southern gas corridor, and what to expect in the long term? Um, in order to to start um, my my speech, first of all, I would like to uh, just make two points about these pipelines. First of all, Nord Stream two and Turk Stream, in in any shape and form they are, whether it uh, used to be South Stream, now it's South Stream Light, as Madame Ambassador mentioned, or South Stream 2.0, as it's been dubbed now. Uh, it's basically an effort, now it's already a successful effort, of Gazprom to bring the same gas from the same fields to the same buyers with a more expen ex uh, expensive route. Uh, it just all boils down to this. Uh, of course, there are geopolitical uh, elements in this. I mean, both gas and oil are geopolitical commodities. You can you don't see. I mean, the lines are blurred there, where there, where the commerciality of the thing ends and where the geopolitics start. Uh, but that's 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 about um, Nord Stream two and uh, Turk Stream. And so far, they have uh, you know succeeded with Nord Stream one, almost succeeded with Nord Stream two, succeeded building the Turk Stream. Uh, both subsea lines, almost done with the on, uh, on land, uh, inland uh, construction. And um, so they have achieved uh, their target of securing and actually increasing its market share in, uh, in Europe, which is probably has been mentioned here, which is growingly becoming import dependent due to uh, North Sea, due to Groningen, technical issues in Groningen, environmental concerns. and. Um, they are taking full advantage of the situation. Uh, for Southern Gas Corridor, it's a different story. It's a, first of all, it's a green project. It has to be done from zero. It's $45 billion project, both upstream and midstream, which will carry gas from a field size of Manhattan uh, all the way through the seven countries and uh, deliver it to, to Italy. And um, if in Nord Stream 2's and Turk Stream's case, it was for, for Russia, for Gazprom, uh, which acts as a, as a tool of Russian energy policy, it was more diversifying away from Ukraine. In Azerbaijan's case, it was more diversifying away from Russia. Uh, they, uh, Gas, uh, Sokar and its partners didn't want to be, didn't want to follow the, the, the suit of Central Asian neighbors, which are uh, almost hundred, almost dependent on either Russian or, or Chinese exports and have very deteriorated relations with Iran. So the, the smartest way to figure out, and also, of course, the commerciality uh, of the issue has also to be considered, uh, to go to the West. And, but the perceptions and, and, the, and the positions in the start of these projects uh, in early 2010s um, were, were, from both sides, it was benign. Uh, we didn't see any opposition, any verbal, any statements made from, uh, from, from Russian side against the pipeline. And their main justification was that the, the volumes are 
back then it was 1 18th of, of Russian volumes supplied to Europe. Now it's, I think it's 1 20th in the best scenario. And, 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 and we see for the last four years, despite the sanction regime against Russia, the Gazprom uh, exports to Europe has been increasing gradually. It's, I, mean, I think Miller uh, today reported uh, to Putin that it has reached 200 billion cubic meters. And um, so it's, in comparison, it's, it's dismal. It's not that much. Um, and Azerbaijan position was that, you know, as, as I mentioned before, the gas is the same gas, the buyers are the same buyer. Uh, I'm talking about the Russian gas, uh, the volumes are not uh, comparable. So we don't see it as a competition as well. So the proponents of, 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 who, of those who say that, you know, these pipelines are not competing, that's what was their main argument. Those who argued that this could serve as a, as a competition or a position was those who were saying that, I think rightfully were saying that, Although it doesn't provide the additional volumes or com uh, com competitive volumes uh, from Azerbaijan, it does provide the uh, infrastructure which is so much needed in, in, in South and Southeast Europe. And given that this pipeline is a scalable, which is a fancy word for easily, you know, throughput capacity can be expanded by uh, three to six times, just adding pump stations, nothing else had to be done along the route, uh, was showing that uh, that was the argument that, you know, it can become a, a huge problem for Russia. Well, so much has been said, but so much has already been done, too. I mean, we have passed through so many stages now, especially the Russians have been building these pipelines in a, such a crazy speed. It's unbelievable how fast they're building these deep sea, very complicated pipelines through Black Sea, and now they're doing the same thing with Nord Stream 2. And also, uh, Sokar and Partners, BP, has done a great job by building the pipeline before the schedule, uh, I mean, the, the, the ton up mainly, before the schedule and under the budget. And now we have the physical infrastructure there. So it's easier, the picture is clearer now, it's easier to see what's gonna happen then. Well, the, uh, the hope was that uh, Central Asian countries will be, su will be supplying gas, and then Istmed was mentioned here, but I think the I think Europe, Europe and United States was really hoping, and a lot of has been done, you know, special, there was special envoy on these issues from the United States State Department to, to figure out these relations between Turkmenistan and Azerbaijan and have this pipeline run. Um, now, now that uh, the time has passed and now we're in 2019 and you know, by the end of this year, all the three pipelines will be constructed and probably starting from next, sometime next year, these pipelines will be supplying gas. When we look at the Central Asia, we see that the situation is not very good for, for, uh, for Trans-Caspian. What's happening in Central Asia, especially in the uh, Central Asia-China pipeline? The pipeline is almost oversupplied. It's uh, thanks to the Kazakhstan supplies. Kazakhstan and uh, Turkmenistan has been, because of their economy and because of, of the falling oil prices, they are uh, pumping as much as possible. Uh, it's almost, this year, the forecast is that it's almost will be 55 billion, billion cubic meters, which is the highest throughput capacity. Uh, and, and both Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan have, have already made a uh, statement that, and on the top level, that they will be doubling, actually, their uh, exports. I don't know how they will fit all that gas in, in, the, in that pipeline, but that's the plan. But the, it, it shows that they're looking east. They're not looking uh, to the west. Uh, and then there was a statement made by Alexander Miller in, uh, I'll say Miller, in, in October. It was more political statement about Turkmenistan that, that gas uh, imports from Turkmenistan will be uh, resumed from 2019, January 1st. And there was a visit by Lavrov after that. Um, so it shows that there's something going on in between Turkmenistan and Russia. Also, there have been mainly political statements, not there, first of all, uh, there, are no, there's, there aren't any updates about actual supplies to Russia. Let me clarify that. Uh, I have checked many sources. Nothing is going on. And, uh, but uh, the, the bottom line is that Central Asian countries are not looking west. I mean, for Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, it's understandable. They have, it's closer to, to China, to Chinese border, not to China, uh, to, the, to the delivery points, actually. And uh, for... Uh, for Turkmenistan, now that the line D, the fourth line of the Central Asia China pipeline is being delayed uh, for unknown reasons, uh, they will probably look north uh, or in the worst scenario, they will go to China again, but they're not looking west. So uh, the idea of filling the gas with Trans-Caspian uh, gas, well, gas from Turkmenistan and other countries is, is not happening. Um, 
Istmet already has been mentioned here, um, Cyprus and Israel, mainly Israel has preferred short uh, pipelines uh, to Jordan to, to even to reverse a, or to build a new pipeline to Egypt, even to Gaza, rather than building an LNG terminal because it's not feasible uh, for that kind of volumes to go for LNG. And they're not even looking north. They, I mean, they, there hasn't been anything done uh, in respect to that. I mean, Exxon and Qatar has announced that they have uh, uh, explored and uh, uh, developed a new field, but in, in like it will take another three to four years to actually develop that. So only hope is for Azerbaijani production. What's happening in Azerbaijan? Um, well, the only good news are also <laughs> from Azerbaijan because there have been some developments. BP and Total have been uh, actively exploring um, shallow water uh, areas, uh, fields of, which mainly are fields that are being explored during the Soviet time, but hasn't been tapped in, and, and the initial results are good. But um, what we're seeing from Azerbaijani side uh, in terms of supplies to Turkey and in terms of supplies to Europe, this even if those fields come online, even they supply gas, uh, First of all, the, the increase in supplies will not be abrupt, it will be gradual. And secondly, it will be mainly directed to Turkish market. So which brings me to, to my point about, about the competition and, and an opposition to, uh, to these pipelines, between these pipelines. What I, what's happening right now is showing that um, there is a competition among these pipelines in terms of infrastructure in Europe. And, and the future effectiveness of this, of this competition, to what extent um, Southern Gas Corridor or TAP will be successful against offsetting Russian uh, volumes will depend on, on those interconnectors, on, on which direction those interconnectors will run, who will actually supply gas to, uh, to these interconnectors, which will also, which will basically depend if Azerbaijan and uh, southern gas corridors can find other sources of gas, which I said that uh, except Azerbaijani own fields, uh, the situation is not that positive. Uh, in terms of Turkey, which all the pipelines are, has already be built, built, Turkey is becoming a place where the competition actually is becoming more uh, 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 visible. Um, both pipelines, again, will be completed. Azerbaijan has already completed the TANAP, uh, and there is a there is a concern, or there is a there is an opportunity that Iranian supplies uh, to Turkey will be somehow affected by sanctions. Although Turkey has been very uh, stern on this issue, but anything can can happen. So there is a chance that um, Turkish market will require additional volumes and more gas, more long-term commitment you have in the Turkish market. It will help you in the future to to protect that share. So the main locus of the competition between these pipelines, mainly Turkstream and 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 Southern Gas Guard or TANAP will be Turkey in a, in a short to midterm perspective. Um, and the future uh, competition, whether it, there will be a competition, will of course depend on, again, I mean, I'm not inventing any, <laughs> any bicycle right now, it will depend on, on additional sources. And uh, sadly, it's, it's only Azerbaijan to, to rely on now. Uh. Little comment. Um, I would probably disagree that uh, countries of Central Asia do not have intentions to uh, look at West and send their resources to the West. But I think at this point, up to now, Russia really outplayed them uh, and Gazprom and uh, all the tools that Russian government has and uh, all the influence they have, not just in Central Asia only, but uh, in other places where that gas supposed to go as a, uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, uh, Europe in this case and the market. So there is a, uh, there is a clearly interest in Central Asian countries to send, uh, have diversified uh, markets, but unfortunate reality is that, uh, uh, that, that the driver of, of consolidation of forces that could uh, somehow allow this process to develop and evolve is uh, is not there, and uh, there is no uh, leadership, I would say, from those who are interested in that gas uh, to really make this this possible. And uh, for in in the position the Central Asian countries are, it's very hard for them to take all the risks uh, that has, this is associated uh, with the, with the development of this Transcaspian project. But that's obviously subject of separate conversation, maybe some other time. But uh, we have. Ilya to speak about Russian mega projects and how uh, Russia manages to support them through different means. 
thank you to organizers uh, for this splendid uh, event. Uh, lots of new information and uh, interesting to hear all the narratives. I I'll mainly try to speak about uh, corruption surrounding uh, uh, Gazprom's activities and uh, specifically Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2, but also going into adjacent areas. So uh, two years ago, uh, I'm from Free Russia Foundation, which is uh, uh, a pro-democracy uh, Russian organization uh, registered in Washington, DC. And uh, two years ago, we published a report called Corruption Pipeline, which you can find on our website for freerussia.org. Uh, and this, is, uh, this was a paper that we wrote after uh, our paper together with the Atlantic Council Kremlin Gas Games. So uh, everything that we couldn't put in the Atlantic Council paper, we put uh, in a very frank way in this corruption pipeline paper, which I highly recommend if you want to learn more about um, corruption surrounding Nord Stream 1 and Gazprom's activity in Europe in general. So uh, when people in Europe, the thing is we have been presenting these uh, two papers uh, around European think tanks, including in Germany. And uh, it was uh, interesting to hear um, that uh, many people genuinely believed uh, that um, there is no corruption coming from, from Russia to Europe. Maybe there is something happening inside Russia, but uh, no, uh, Europe has strong regulators who you know, will stop any past, current, and future corruption. Um, and I mean, some people uh, uh, were obviously presenting this because they have vested interests uh, and they're partners with Gazprom or somehow connected with Russians, but they were, there was a genuine pool of people who, who genuinely uh, been brainwashed about this. And uh, um, it's pretty uh, depressing to see this because uh, th there's been multiple investigations into Gazprom's activity by Russian activists, opposition forces, uh, so uh, Boris Nemtsov and uh, Vladimir Milov wrote no, uh, a number of reports on Rosokoronerga uh, corruption uh, scheme, uh, which involved uh, Firtash and uh, uh, Semyon Magilevich wanted by FBI. Um, and it actually uh, is a very good example to, to show that a lot of corruption in Ukraine has been uh, deliberately uh, developed by by Russia through such schemes. I, I'm not saying that there is no uh, domestic corruption in Ukraine, but uh, a lot to do with gas has been tr historically built up by, by Russia um, and pro-Putin um, networks. Um, there, is, there is a well-covered story about Rotenberg companies uh, earning at least $1 billion on very dodgy, uh, corrupt, uh, uh, contracts on Nord Stream 1. So basically, Rottenberg companies acted as intermediaries to sell steel pipelines uh, between steel plants and uh, Nord Stream 1. Um, completely pointless, uh, um, uh, 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 artificial, artificially created uh, intermediary. Um, then, uh, there are multiple stories uh, about Gazprom's corruption in general. Uh, if you look through those reports, uh, also, if you just uh, literally Google major uh, Gazprom board members or uh, management board members, you will see that, in fact, hardly any of them have no corruption stories or investigations around them. Um, so Viktor Zubkov, chairman of the board, has been cited by uh, Spanish prosecution files that uh, he acted as a um, uh, spokes uh, as a, as a, a lobbyist for uh, Russian mafia in Spain uh, inside Russia. Uh, obviously, this is a this was a very complicated case, but there are uh, Spanish prosecution bugged uh, Russian mafia in Spain, and there are conversations about this and other evidence. Um, Sadly, that case was is now in sort of a limbo in Spain after 10 years of investigation. Hopefully, the prosecution will appeal some of the very strange decisions on, on that um, uh, case. Uh, then there are interesting investigations by Nova Gazette about Kirill Selizhnev. Uh, a, a particular article I, I recommend called uh, Condensate of Billions. It's, it speaks about uh, corruption around, around distribution pipelines, uh, but also about um, how uh, 
Selizhnyov and his people um, got profits from uh, acting as intermediaries uh, in the sale of um, Kazakh gas to, to Orenburg plant. Um, and there are many out, I mean, recently, um, so some of the subordinates uh, of, uh, or proxies of um, uh, Selizhnyov were arrested uh, in Russian Federation Council. Rauf Arashukov, a 31-year-old sen uh, senator who uh, got uh, in the Federation Council thanks to his father who traded gas uh, with illegal, through illegal schemes and also been now arrested. Um, um, so uh, there are multiple stories, but to return back to Nord Stream 1 and 2, there is a, a, a our, our papers cover a, a, a case of Nordic yards. So in East Pomerania, uh, there, there, there is a dock uh, which was bought at some point um, by uh, Minister uh, Yusufov, who was uh, Minister of Energy Yusufov, and who, who was also a board member of Gazprom. And his son was head of uh, Nord Stream 1 office uh, in, in Moscow. So uh, it's a very illustrative case because for many years, Russians promised, um, firstly, it wasn't revealed that the, 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 these people were behind this scheme. F finally, it became clear. They promised to, uh, it was a bankrupt uh, uh, dock in, in Germany, actually in electoral district of Angela Merkel herself. So they promised to, um, uh, bring back employment, to bring new projects. The idea was actually to connect this uh, dock uh, with Viborg plant uh, in near St. Petersburg region and to service Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 with ships, with different contracts. It's a story which interestingly was covered a little bit in German press and a lot in Russian press, but never in English press. So our report just retold that story, but somehow it remains below the radar. But it's a major corruption story, which was investigated by German newspapers. Uh, we know for a fact that uh, uh, this was discussed up to the level of Dmitry Medvedev and Angela Merkel. There was no nothing done about this. Uh, so German police found, and, and some other European police found, money laundering schemes, involvement of Russian mafia, money in that uh, scheme, uh, bl broken promises, and finally uh, Yusufov and his people sold this uh, dock a few years ago because they couldn't, could no, they no longer had use for this. Um, uh, so this is uh, this is a major story which essentially German police decided to turn a blind eye on. But when when the uh, German policymakers tell you that uh, Gazprom's corruption and Russian corruption is not in Europe, uh, show them that case and uh, show our, them our, our paper. To, uh, further on corruption, uh, I mean, in 2011, uh, European Commission opened an antitrust investigation into Gazprom's activity in nine European countries. Um, somehow, it ended up nowhere. So this case, as I understand, was uh, watered down and, and sort of closed down. There was no proper uh, fine. Uh, Gazprom made some promises to change its behavior, which I think essentially just uh, reflects de facto market uh, changes that Gazprom had to take anyway, uh, because of the you know change of uh, some of the contracts by other suppliers, uh, some flexibilities that they had to show vis-a-vis -vis LNG market, uh, liquidity of li LNG uh, uh, supplies. So. Uh, in my view, antitrust investigation by Europe essentially failed to, to bring any justice to the nine claimants, uh, uh, including Poland and several other countries. Um, I have um, uh, a friend, uh, uh, Mikhail Karchemkin, who run, runs uh, East European Gas Analysis, uh, and uh, he's been one of the vocal critics of Gazprom. He actually uh, told me, asked me to convey at this uh, uh, presentation, his view that maybe Gerhard Schroeder should be tried by, under FCPA um, by the US. While it's a very radical um, proposal, um, uh, it's, uh, if you look at it at a at, at, uh, um, with the sober eyes, uh, uh, here's what we have. Um, a German chancellor uh, promoted a project in which he became a CEO right after he uh, uh, lost his ch chancellorship, and then uh, 
to the detriment of shareholders of that uh, of Gazprom, uh, all these corrupt schemes took took place. Rosuker and Erga, Nord Stream One. Uh, so. Uh, it's not only Russian taxpayers which I of which I will talk about, but it's also uh, US shareholders who lost uh, uh, because of some of the uh, activities and lost dividends. So Karchamkin himself told me that he has some money in US pension funds who have some stakes in Gazprom. So um, I'm not a specialist on FCPA, but this is a view by one of the Russian uh, leading Russian experts who I think is worth exploring. Um, then, uh, I, I would like uh, to, uh, to say that um, uh, we have um, an another interesting story that uh, I, I want to talk about is, uh, I mean, here, uh, our, uh, my uh, previous panel, previous panel uh, um, Ukrainian colleagues said that Russian pensioners are very happy to help uh, mm -hmm. uh, to help um, Gazprom. Actually, they are not happy. They, are, they are not been asked about this. Uh, so uh, my friend Vladimir Milov uh, recently has been saying that um, Gazprom is paying uh, around, last year paid only 26% of its profits to, uh, in dividends, although state-controlled companies are required to pay at least 50%. Um, this is apart from all the various tax breaks and uh, hol tax holidays and favors from the state that Gazprom gets anyway. So. Uh, even by his, by Milo's very conservative account, uh, in my view, it's very conservative. Just for that alone, Gazprom uh, loses for Russian share, uh, tax, taxpayers around three to four billion dollars a year, and that money directly. The uh, excuse for that is that that money re is required for Gazprom to build uh, pipelines. Uh, it it it's go it goes. Uh, under the pretext that they need more uh, in uh, capex money, uh, capital expenditure money, uh, and capital expenditure money is really m primarily for pipelines, uh, Turk Stream, Nord Stream Two, and uh, power of Siberia. Um, so uh, the biggest losers have been uh, taxpayers and uh, 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 shareholders, in my view. And uh, uh, if, if you want to look at uh, various other corruption stories, uh, we, uh, Free Russia, together with my participation and some other experts, uh, is running a website called underminers.info. And there is a profile of Alexei Miller where you can find all the cor corruption stories surrounding him. Uh, in fact, Miller has now consolidated his power uh, in the company, uh, some of the other Insiders recently left the uh, uh, the, the board of uh, directors. Uh, Medve Alexander Medvedev, uh, uh, Golubev, um, and so uh, despite all the talk about his corruption, uh, Miller's corruption and inefficiency, he actually uh, has consolidated his power. Um, Free Russia also helped. Uh, um, Activists in uh, in uh, the Baltic countries, uh, in Estonia, where um, Russian activists w were unable to file these uh, protests in Russia, so they filed it with the Estonian uh, in environmental ministry. That uh, Nord Stream Two is now destroying Kurgalsky Natural Reserve. Um, so this is not necessarily about corruption, but this is about damaging economic activity. Um, and this story is also under the radar. So a major reserve in Russia is being destroyed and no one pays attention or does anything about it. Um, and also I wanted to touch upon uh, normalization of corruption and normalization of things that shouldn't be normalized in the West. So a, a lot of uh, things have been said about Germany today. Uh, one additional thing I wanted to add is that Vladimir Yakunin is, uh, is considered uh, as one of the most corrupt persons uh, uh, by um, all Russian opposition figures and investigators. There are numerous stories about his palaces, his, uh, his billions of dollars made out of Russian railways. So he now runs uh, a major think tank across Europe with headquarters in Berlin, uh, where with the support of uh, German, this person is under US sanctions. Uh, for his proximity to Putin and for corruption stories. Uh, so Vladimir Yakunin, an ex-KGB officer, 
uh, got permission from German government not only to operate uh, this think tank uh, with headquarters in Berlin, but also uh, he got a special visa uh, to, to do business, to, to f go around Europe and um, go to conferences. Um, and actually, there's been recently news that he plans to open um, uh, another, a branch of his think tank in New York. So congratulations to all, uh, to all of us. Um, it's interesting to see how, how figures of uh, uh, close to Putin are managing to avoid uh, sanctions or circumvent them. Uh, and uh, here I go uh, with uh, suggestions for US government about related to corruption and what can be done. So actually my first suggestion is expose more because uh, just translate some of the Russian investigations or German investigations, then I'm sure FBI sits on piles of information about uh, things that uh, are now being uh, slowly revealed about laundromats uh, and various money laundering activities uh, because they're all connected with uh, the stories I mentioned before. Uh, Rottenberg family has been very successful in circumventing Europe uh, very uh, superficial and very small sanctions that uh, Europe has placed on them. There are uh, concrete stories on how they've been able to uh, avoid those sanctions. Um, and uh, uh, in general, uh, I would also agree that only U.S. sanctions can stop um, uh, Nord Stream 2. I, I don't think Europe is capable itself in... in um, in preventing this project, it, it in a, in a way it uh, for me repeats the story of South Stream, and I hope uh, the U.S. intervenes at the very last moment. And the very last point about um, uh, a narrative that Russian propaganda uses a lot that the only reason that the U.S. is uh, trying to torpedo tr tries to torpedo the um, Nord Stream 2 project is because they just greedily want to put U.S. LNG to to European markets. So. Um, obviously, there, there has been some, um, uh, some statements from uh, U.S. administration and U.S. Uh, Congress that, that seem to support this view uh, or, or have been interpreted by, by Russian propaganda. But um, I would recommend uh, U.S. policymakers to distinguish the activity uh, that no administrative uh, leverage or corruption mechanisms or any other support in any form from US government came uh, for this uh, uh, commercially uh, uh, organized contracts with Lithuania and Poland. So yes, maybe Poland and Lithuania, as was pointed out by Stephen Blank uh, in the previous panel, maybe they overpaid. Actually, we don't know that for a fact. Uh, these contracts are, uh, are uh, they're, they're, they're commercial contracts with, we don't know the actual pricing. I presume they're slightly, uh, uh, more price than um, Gazprom, but several things have to be pointed out. These national governments took this decision on their own. They are ready to pay the security premium themselves. Actually, it drove gas. It changed Gazprom's behavior, and uh, Gazprom reduced its pricing. Um, so, uh, actually, com from commercial point of view, it worked for the benefit of these countries, not only from security point of view. And U.S. government was never behind these commercial deals. The, this was a choice. Uh, in fact, Europe is a, uh, maybe third or fourth priority for U.S. LNG companies who make the decisions uh, on commercial basis, on so-called uh, uh, LNG arbitrage. They, they mainly send their gas to South America and Asia and uh, are not interested in corruption schemes. They're interested in the best pricing they can get commercially. So they don't need to um, uh, live uh, through, uh, through corruption. And um, um, I'll, uh, we, we can discuss more about corruption during Q&A. Thank you. Before opening floor for questions, let me very briefly summarize the picture that we are facing today. So. Uh, in fact, Russia managed, uh, by the end of this year probably, it will, uh, it will be reality, that uh, Russia will have uh, both Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 built, uh, and Turk Stream already uh, almost completed, which means that Russia, Russian gas could easily bypass Ukraine, uh, 
uh, in its supply to Europe. And, uh, uh, and Russia achieved this, all this uh, with um, multiple means, using politics, using pressure, using corruption and other means. But clearly, Russia is pretty successful in this, uh, uh, in this process. And uh, the, the picture that looked like maybe very bad dream five, six, seven years ago is already reality. In addition, with this presence on entering the markets that, uh, that are uh, uh, potentially I mean, on the southern flank, potentially targets for south, uh, southern corridor uh, supply line, uh, Russia obviously will compete um, and, um, with some of the markets there. And with that, uh, uh, create environment, and particularly if the uh, Turk Stream 2 is developed and built, uh, it will clearly uh, create a problem for other suppliers. and. Uh, because Russia is, I mean, Gazprom is a uh, state-owned company, before, be, because uh, priority is obviously, uh, uh, in addition to profit, major priority is politics, uh, Russia also and Gazprom could always play with the pricing, while other commercial suppliers and producers in the region cannot uh, allow themselves to play with the pricing in that regard. So this is a picture. Uh, and uh, with that, I would like to open our floor for questions. Thank you. You don't see a country that rea re is reacting heavily to the sanctions. When you talk to people, they say, yeah, it's impinging, it's particular nasty to people who are on sanctions lists, it's particularly problematic for companies that are trying to do business with the West, but there's big wide world there with India, China, Southeast Asia, et cetera. When you talk to people, people sort of shrug and say, well, yeah, we know there's corruption, but I do not see people really getting excited about it, getting in the streets or otherwise expressing their disgust. I mean, they express their disgust in a private conversation, but it doesn't translate into a political reaction. This, the opposition is so squeezed that they cannot really do something massive. So how do you think the corruption issue in Russia internally can be translated into a change that is absolutely necessary? It's necessary for the Russian society inside, it's necessary for Europe, it's necessary for the United States. Because as long as we're doing sanctions, the Russian propaganda is spinning it as, oh, this is against Russia, this is against Russian state, this is against Russian people, and our communication strategy is not reaching broad circles in Russia, I think something is missing in this piece. And Ilya, in particular to you, what, can, what else can the United States do, or United States and Europe, what can we do to demonstrate that it is the Russian pensioners and it's, you know, what we used to call in the 80s when I was doing these things, Ivan the six-pack, Vanya the six-pack, that it's they're paying that price, both economically and politically, and how you translate this into a political change. Thank you. Great question, Ariel. And um, uh, firstly, I would uh, say that uh, current U.S. sanctions are very superficial in, to my taste. So they are nowhere comparable to, say, sanctions against Iran. Um, they, they, there are only intentions. Uh, so under CARTS, uh, Countering American Adversaries uh, Act, uh, um, they, they, there, there is an intention to sanction over 200 uh, officials and oligarchs, but so far less than 10. Um, so, that, so there are proposals, uh, DASCA, uh, further uh, cards, uh, sanctions in that regard, but they still have to be fulfilled. Um, secondly, I would say that there is political. Excuse me, I, I don't understand. Uh -huh. so DASCA and CATSA have not passed. Well, CATSA has has been passed, and they only sanctioned uh, less than ten oligarchs: so Vexelberg, uh, Suleiman Kirimov, Diripaska. Um, and few others, um, but the, the, the intention is to sanction 96 oligarchs and 
over 100 officials, um, which hasn't, hasn't been done. Well, I'm just saying that, in my view, sanctions, we're talking about very different sanctions compared to other countries like against Belarus or Iran. They are this thin compared. So there's much more that can be done just in that regard. Secondly, there has been an effect. So everyone is talking about a chilling effect on investments, inability to borrow money. I actually don't see Chinese rushing to provide cheap money to uh, Russians in multiple inc uh, projects, including in energy projects. So uh, Chinese are providing very narrow loans and at high price. Um, so there is already effect. Living standards of, Russia, of ordinary Russians have fallen. And uh, yes, there is a competition between TV set and the fridge, as we say, and the TV is still winning, but uh, Russian people are uh, starting to feel the pain. Um, and it's shown uh, in multiple ways, including in massive immigration under Putin. So yes, people are not allowed to go to streets uh, freely, uh, although they still do. But uh, recently Free Russia uh, participated in a major report with the Atlantic Council about drain, brain drain. So two million people, by very conservative account, two million people left uh, Russia under Putin. And uh, there was a, a spike in immigration after 2012, primarily from middle class, educated, relatively well-off uh, professionals who just see no future in, in Russia for themselves. So they left for political reasons. And uh, that's just one of the symptoms of uh, the reaction. Um, the, uh, uh, even by official um, uh, polls, Putin's popularity is falling. Uh, and I mean, I could talk more about this. What, what can be done uh, more by the US? I definitely uh, translate uh, Russian investigations, uh, uh, the ones that I mentioned that are under the radar, many, many others. Publish more things like Panama Papers and uh, money, Troika Laundromat and other Laundromat schemes. There is much more to, to be published, in my view. I'm, I'm positive that the FBI is sitting on piles of information and not using it for political reasons, that people still, the administration is still reluctant to provoke Putin too much. And um, uh, just continue with um, various uh, uh, further sanctions and the FCPA and, and criminal investigations. Thank you. Uh, Wayne Mary, the American Foreign Policy Council. Uh, all day long I've taken notes of people saying only U.S. sanctions can stop Nord Stream 2. And it's pretty clear people are not talking about sanctions on Russians, but sanctions on Germans, German entities, German people. Now, my colleague Steve Blank has pointed out that sanctioning Germans along with what we're talking about with Huawei and intelligence sharing is creating a crisis in the relationship between the United States and its most important continental European ally. The German government also did a deal with Paris so that the supervision of Nord Stream 2 would not take place in Brussels, but in Berlin. And there's no way that Macron is going to back off on that, right? So the idea of a European Union supervision of Nord Stream 2 is essentially a dead duck. The German government, according to the Financial Times and the German press, also made a deal with Washington that they would put up the money to build an LNG terminal at Hamburg in addition to the LNG terminals that exist in Belgium and other places in Europe, but with the understanding that there would be no sanctions against German entities and that if there are any sanctions against German entities, that LNG is also, terminal is also a dead duck. Not too long thereafter, Senator Menendez opened his presentation of his new sanctions bill by stating in his first sentence, this is not about Nord Stream 2. I would like the speakers to specify if only US sanctions can stop Nord Stream 2, and those are sanctions against Germans, specify what legislation, what entities, what individuals, at what cost. Don't just talk to me about sanctions in general. I used to work on the Hill. You gotta be concrete. What sanctions are you proposing against what entities and what in, in, in what legislation and at what cost? Yeah, and I'm, I'm not gonna first of all I didn't I didn't say that the sanctions are needed. I think it's 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 useless right now. It's 
Yes, yes. Um, but I agree that that's needed, but I don't think it's, it's going to be practical. About the German-Washington uh, deal, uh, I think uh, Washington has been a little bit deceived there by German enthusiasm. And that's not the only thing that Germans have been involved in terms of discouraging the, uh, encouraging the additional uh, alternative routes. There was a, unexpectedly, there was a um, loan from German banks to Southern Gas Corridor. And then uh, German companies are involved in trans uh, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, India pipeline, which is, has been there for, for two, I mean, <laughs> for forever and hasn't been done yet. But they're showing that they're also, because uh, Taliban doesn't want Americans there and Germans are seem like the more neutral one. And But the Germans' idea of the LNG, first of all, that LNG uh, terminal in Hamburg, that's been as an idea be way before that deal. Uh, so they're just, they're just selling them a ready product. And it's actually the, for the best interest of Germany to become a hub, another hub, or another, another LNG terminal there. It's not the interest of whole Europe. It's, it's completely in the interest of Germany to do that because of the Groningen, because of all the production going down. And I don't know how uh, Washington took it as a, as a bargaining chip, but that, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, to t sum it up, I think it's too late for sanctions. Everyone is like having hope that you know the South Stream scenario will be will be repeated, but I I don't see it happening. But I will leave it to Ilya to to comment more on that. So uh, different people are talking about different sanctions right now. As far as I could read, uh, the the question is about subcontractors who are laying pipelines. And uh, this is a Swiss company, I think called Old Seas. Yes, and there are only two or three more. Uh, subcontractors who can do this, Italians uh, and French. yes, not, not Germans actually. The only German company involved is uh, Bas Wintershell and uh, um, actually for me there is a scope to, for sanctions there because no one actually raised this today that everyone talked about Nord Stream 2 but there is a, a, an ongoing uh, development with a JV between uh, Alpha Bank's sp controlled DIA a former utility, a former upstream part of RWD and uh, BUSF, and uh, where Alpha Bank uh, people will have uh, a third. And it's, a merger. it's a merger, yes, and uh, they are going to be a major uh, receiving, uh, on the receiving end of gas in Germany. So uh, we, we will have a group of Russian oligarchs with their German friends receiving Russian gas from Nord Stream 2. So uh, the Alpha people have been um, on uh, Karatsa list and uh, they have been, there's been a lot of discussion whether they should be placed on, under sanctions. But also Gazprom said that if uh, these sanctions against subcontractors go through, they have their own money and maybe the China will help them and they will still build it. So if any of that money is in US dollars, uh, U.S. government has means to, to uh, sanction uh, those transactions. Um, I'm pretty sure that if we're talking about specific pool of money being applied to a specific project, U.S. government knows what to do about this. So um, there is a lot of scope. No, I would perfectly agree. I think these... Uh the list of activities that are needed at this stage is very clear, and I think it's the, those are the companies on one hand. The, uh, on the other hand, those that are potential beneficiaries that we have uh, uh, been able to identify and we will try to or we will have to map out in the future that will be beneficiaries of the various uh, aspects of development of the uh, the project potentially, but that the that the uh, sanctions in themselves will not solve the problem is probably very likely, but that they can hurt. And if they are seriously targeted and seriously uh, um, designed, that they can be an efficient one of the tools that we all have to be sort of used is very clear. To Ilya's point about the OLCs, uh, there are only four or five companies in the world that can build such complex deep water subsea uh, pipeline. and. If, if they want to do something, just uh, sanction all seas and all other four are also Western. There is none, any other non-Western company who can do it. By the way, all seas is the most sophisticated and the fastest one in the world. And it's the best time to sanction it because it's now in the North Sea doing a scheduled work. So it will never go back to, uh, to finish the Nord Stream 2. 
may comment yeah, on, okay. on the sanctions. Uh, the uh, Dusk 2019 bill actually has provision that sanctions Russian uh, pipelines over Russian pipelines that cost over 250 million. So that includes both now North Stream 2 and South Stream, um, Turkish Stream, uh, uh, within this scope. Question is, we have already two individuals with their companies involved in the building of Nord Stream 2 on the Russian side, these are uh, Rottenberg and Timchenko. Uh, but we have not sanctioned Nord Stream 2 companies that cooperate with Timchenko and Rottenberg, although they've been on the sanctions list since 2014 Crimea invasion. I think there is a way to sanction the, the companies that work on Nord Stream 2 the way uh, the United, United States told uh, the Bulgarian government back in uh, 2014 that they would sanction every company that works with a company owned by Timchenko that was awarded the contract to build the pipelines. And uh, it that worked. Um, I don't see how and why this wasn't done until now. It we could have saved a lot of uh, pessimism here. If there are no questions from, from audience, I would like to ask Ambassador, you mentioned earlier about uh, interconnectors. And uh, can you tell us a little bit more about those? Uh, th most of them we are centered actually in, in Hungary, correct? I mean, it, yeah. you, you mentioned like four or five actually. Of, of her. So, but gas for that supposed to come from where? And what are the volumes of, of in, uh, involved in, in that? If you could clarify a little bit more about that. Yeah, certainly. No, uh, I um, mentioned the interconnectors that are linking the countries of the region. And since um, the sort of landlocked country, there are two landlocked countries that have no access to see Slovakia and Hungary are sort of in this, in the intersection of all of this, most of the interconnectors are linked to that, uh, those two countries, because they have to get out, get, you know, out of the uh, uh, landlocked status. So, um, the uh, um, there has been a whatever an, a, a good decade pro probably of of developing these interconnectors and and it's ha it has been quite a long process. Uh, the um, last bit the, the last bit that is still being developed is the uh, Polish Slovakian interconnector that is allowing for this Central European region to get access to the northern um, sort of access to to the global markets at Szwinoja. But the, uh, previously what has been built is the, uh, the Hungarian-Romanian, the Hungarian-Croatian interconnectors, um, all allowing for, for instance, the Hungarian-Romanian interconnector has been under European uh, sort of regulation um, um, uh, uh, in a problematic situation because the, uh, the bidirectional or uh, nature was not established, which was totally contrary to the uh, European um, Energy uh, Union's energy package. And I think that probably was one of the last and longest uh, um, holding uh, problem uh, in, in this because the um, interconnectivity was held. I mean, it was developed, but it was not bidirectional. Now the, uh, uh, the compressor stations are being built, and this is the probably over the last year or so it has been uh, established, but un under a long-term pressure. The, um, uh, yeah, the, uh, the question was with the Hungarian-Croatian interconnector, uh, uh, for instance, which was built, was that that doesn't lead to anywhere because the Croatian uh, decision has not been made about building the uh, LNG terminal. And so the current situation is that most of these interconnectors um, uh, well, some of them have access through the Austria and Baumgarten hub uh, to Russian gas or non-Russian gas that gets to the hub. Uh, the Hungarian-Romanian interconnector is designed for the Romanian offshore developments, which are hopefully coming, which are very promising. Um, the um, Hungarian-Slovakian one is designed for the northern access, and yes, the Hungarian-Croatian one is a dead end. That's which now works from in, one, in a one-directional way from Hungary towards Croatia, fundamentally Russian gas, but it's a, um, a lack of decision-making, which, I mean, uh, has not been done by the Croatian government. 
Thank you, I think that's helpful. Rauf, is there, are there any plans for Southern Corridor gas? Uh, most of this gas is already contracted, as I understand. Yeah. Uh, and some of it goes to Bulgaria, or uh, which Eastern European country other than Greece and, uh, and Italy? Are there any other countries uh, other than Turkey that gets this gas other than Turkey and Italy? There, there has been agreement, I think Margarita knows better, there has been agreement with Bulgaria uh, for one BCM and one billion cubic, cubic meters. Uh, the thing with Eastern European countries is that although, and that's actually against the Russian argument that um, you know, we supply way more than Azerbaijani gas, Thinks that the domestic uh, the domestic consumption in these countries is not that much. It's it's and in Bulgaria it's three three to four BCM and most of them goes to actually industry. I, I think that not very substantial. Bulgaria is three BCM. Macedonia is under half BCM. Greece is about three BCM. Serbia is about three and a half. Um, you have really really small markets. In, uh, in the Balkans in particular, and we're talking here about, about about 10 BCM of Russian gas that is annually imported to the Balkans. This is pretty much a fraction of what Poland uh, consumes, about 17 probably, um, Romania about 12. Less than Romania, what Romania consumes a year is the entire Balkan market. And for this 10 BCM or under 10 BCM, the Balkans are so dependent politically, not only economically, on Russia, that it is unforgivable. And I think uh, Azerbaijani gas is going to make yeah. the most significant difference, uh, bring the most significant difference to these markets. Yeah, I think that's a that's very important factor, is that when we talk about Southeast Europe, the volumes are not big. Uh, they're uh, yes. very important. Yes, yes, because there's not region, enough gas to... to some, some, for different reasons. In some countries, they're more dependent on coal. That's why, uh, and, and it's actually local coal. Uh, that's why they're importing less. But since there, there is a uh, switch to less carbon intensive, uh, and there's a push from Brussels to do so, yes, there will be a demand. And, but that demand can be supplied by Azerbaijan, and can be supplied with gradual incremental increases, and actually thanks to the to these fields that Azerbaijan have and now being developed. Thank you very much, uh, Shailan from Turkish Embassy. Thank you very much for organizing this panel. Before asking my question, I have two short comments on Mr. Mamadov's remarks regarding that uh, the competition will take place in Turkey. First one, uh, we have a different understanding of it because um, um, in our term, all these, not all, but most of these developments will serve the long-standing goal of Turkey to be an energy uh, terminal uh, in terms of, or, of course, our own uh, demand and our own market, but also in terms for the sake of the uh, European uh, energy security. Um, uh, the second issue, you, 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 you made a reference to Iran and our uh, gas trade with Iran. Apparently, the current sanction re regime uh, is, does not affect uh, the trade between Turkey and Iran, but predictability is one thing that we are all longing in this town. We don't know. Having said that, uh, our position is very loud and clear about unilateral sanction regime that it will not, uh, that unilateral sanctions are not uh, efficient and effective uh, to reach uh, desired outcomes. Uh, my question is about uh, indeed Turkey Stream 2 and uh, ongoing uh, meetings or uh, negotiations between several countries of the uh, Balkans and Moscow. Uh, I think uh, what we heard here from, from the news that Greece, uh, Bulgaria, Macedonia, Serbia, they are all are very interested in TS2. Do you have any information on, 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 on these negotiations between Moscow and, the, cap and the, uh, the capitals of the Balkans? Thank you. I think the reference were made uh, to my comment. So, uh, uh, yes, Turkey will benefit from that. Uh, that goes without saying, more gas you have, I mean, more leverage you have. About Turkey becoming, uh, you said, gas transit, energy, energy, energy hub. Energy. Uh, from technical standpoint, I ascribe to the idea that Turkey is far from becoming an energy hub. It is a primary transit country, but uh, from industry perspective, in order to become a hub, you have to have a fully liberalized market, which is Turkey is trying to do, but you also have to have enough uh, gas storages. Uh, Turkey's gas storage uh, capacity is equal to Azerbaijan's gas capacity, which is almost 5 billion cubic meters for a population of 70 million dollars, 70, 80 million people, and 
the territory big and industry is big, I think it's uh, Turkey has to work on that to become a hub. Then you'll have more uh, uh, leverage to do so. And I will leave it to, to Ambassador to answer about this. <laughs> if you're, if you're uh, no, I can answer no, I that. I can answer that too. Uh, if I thought maybe you had some points on that. Uh, uh, about the agreements, there has been a. Uh, I think Bulgaria has been switching back and forth in this issue. There has been agreement between Russians and, and Serbs. Uh, Serbia has, has shown commitment, uh, uh, which I, th I think these are the usual suspects who always lean towards uh, uh, Russia, unless there is a uh, stick coming from <laughs> from United States in terms of the sanctions or not. But so far, these are the countries that have been willing. I think my humble opinion is that they, it will be a South Stream 2.0. It will be the same thing going towards Baumgarten. That's uh, the, the amount of gas supplied uh, from Russia to, to Austria uh, has increased dramatically recently. The, uh, the head of OMB was visiting uh, Russia, and he also mentioned that. I think Baumgarten t will be a hub. I mean, will be an important hub for, will remain an important hub for Russia. And I think that's, that will be their direction uh, to, towards Europe. Any other questions? It means that we've exhausted the subject. <laughs> and uh, thanks to our wonderful speakers, and thanks to Jamestown Foundation for organizing this conference, and uh, to all other speakers. Thank you.